Okay, so Liam said I'm a curator with an organisation called Commonage, which is an art and architecture organisation that began as the architecture strand of this festival, the Iron Reef Festival. Um, and I'm going to talk about the Iron Reef Festival. And, um, Liam asked me to speak about programming, engagement and promotion at the Iron Reef Festival. And because our subtitle is the festival of, of Community Festival of Inclusion and Participation, I'm going to talk about participation as well. Um, the festival was started in 2010, but I became involved in 2011 through working with Commonage. At that time, I'd say I dabbled with the, the committee, but uh, since 2012, I've been a pretty full-time um, member of the committee. I program the Heritage Strand through work with Commonage. I program the Architecture Strand with my colleagues. And also, I'm a co-curator of the Visual Arts and Contemporary Music Strand. Um, my own background is that I have a master's degree in art history, and I also worked in heritage. And I think the work in heritage, though, I was doing it in the sense when I finished college to pay my bills, actually has really informed my work with contemporary visual art and, and then into architecture as well. So um, I'm going to talk, I have a series of slides, I'm actually aware I have quite a lot of slides to get through, uh, images from the festival, and I'm going to use them just to try and talk about what works for us and what doesn't work, so I don't really have um, kind of specific learning points that I'm going to go through, but um, certainly if there are questions afterwards, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more about them. I will mention this slide, which is um, our world record attempt in 2012 for the largest ever rock the boat. Unfortunately, we didn't win. <laughs> we didn't break the world record, um, but it was just a, a really nice um, moment for uh, to, to gather a large group of people in the town. In fact, we needed, I think, about 2,000 people to beat the record, and that's kind of the population of Callum. So it's a small rural town. Um, what really informs our work in the festival, though, is that in this small town there are two intentional communities, which are Camp Hill Callan and the Light community. And both of those communities are environments where adults with a disability are supported to work, to uh, pursue education and to be involved in their local community. So that's really informing the idea, um, as I say, of inclusion. Um, but the central tenants, uh, not to sound twee, um, but the central tenets of the festival are to h highlight local places, stories and, and activities. And Brian was talking yesterday, yesterday about the interesting thing of a community talking to itself about itself. In effect, and this is where I say I don't want to sound twee, the town itself is our object for exhibition. And the town and its stories and the people who, who are there and, and the kind of life, uh, cultural activities that are happening anyway in the town. So those are the things that we're trying to highlight in, uh, in the festival. Um, this was the White Tent, which was a circus act uh, called Nicole Martin, who are a Swiss circus act, who came in 2012 and uh, pitched their tent in the um, workhouse. In fact, Callan actually has very rich built heritage, and there are three national monuments in the centre of the town, and they don't include uh, the workhouse, but we try to utilise um, these spaces. But you can see it's a town that has, like every town in Ireland, very particular character. Um, in 2010, when the festival was started, there was, I suppose, a sense of coming to terms with the Celtic Tiger era of, of building, the folly of all of that engagement with their built environment and trying to bring it back down into very real uh, terms in, in a community um, way. So there was an impulse to look at the um, what has a town that has a decaying centre, like many Irish towns, but to do that in a, in a slightly more lateral way and part of this is to focus not just on the town centre which is decaying but looking at other spaces in the town that actually are very rich public spaces though a lot of these spaces are kind of owned and negotiated somehow between public and private so this is the um, Abbey Meadow it's one of our national monuments in the town but the Abbey Meadow is in trust in a 999 year lease to the town to the people of Callan and maintained by the Callan Community Network so these kind of complex ideas of who owns land and who can use land and, and how space is being used for cultural activities actually I think they probably exist in a lot of um, a lot of towns this is I think a very successful excuse me model of using um, spaces that were otherwise derelict Fenley's is it is in private ownership now but it would have been a pub on a street called Bridge Street which is in fact a medieval street 
that hasn't been developed since probably the 1950s because although it now only fits one lane of traffic, it's hard to believe at one time it was main thoroughfare between Clonmel and Kilkenny and then Cork and on to um, Dublin if you extend it so to uh, Arctic trucks or buses or lots of cars often passing on this really narrow street. So the t this particular street uh, was almost absolutely derelict and in fact some of the shops are simply shop fronts but Fenley's uh, was a venue that a, a woman called Aton Houlihan who I work with as a co-curator in the visual arts and contemporary music Aton has used this space as a cultural venue and so that's kind of the lateral way of looking at you know starting a conversation around decaying space or around cultural spaces it's not to go in and suggest this is what should happen but to kind of incrementally make those things happen um, through events uh, like eight one holes at families um, the architecture strand uh, was very much part of um, the beginning and I, I say the kind of impulse of starting the festival and commonage was set up as a project uh, that was to form the architectural strand and they uncovered um, in the first year quite a lot of um, you know unused spaces that had potential for more public use like the co-op building but rather as I say like families go in and suggest this is what the co-op could be used for what they did is cleared out the space and opened up an exhibition about the built environment. Um, now the co-op is used for lots of cultural activities. It's the box office for the festival. There's a lease from the farmers' co-op to the people of the town to use the space as a cultural venue. So there are gigs, there are um, plays, art exhibitions, and so on. This is Aton here speaking at um, the Visual Arts Trail in 2013 um, as part of a programme called Fenley's Curates, where Aton invited in contemporary artists to consider very particular stories about the town as the sort of beginning of, of making new work and um, so this was Helena Tobin who made a work called A Sight of Knowing Unknowing which is about the story of Bridget Clear if people are familiar with that story one of the last witches uh, or the last woman accused of being a witch who was burned in Ireland in the late 1890s and this happened in Mulnahone which is only about 10 miles from, um, from Callan. Um, this is a, a, another one of the Fanley's Curates programmes that Aton was giving a talk here. This is actually in a derelict retail space and sometimes that is like something that I wanted to um, think about when I was putting together this talk is the idea of the subtitle here which is in a vacant retail location. Um, in my experience, retail locations can be a little bit more tricky because, um, w you know, if, if a space is vacant, there are obviously lots of complicated reasons as to why a space is vacant. Maybe the person who owns it is encountering economic difficulties, and so it's a very delicate, um, a delicate sort of situation. So, I mean, it's not that it's not possible. Obviously, we do use these spaces, but you have to be very aware of what the responsibilities of the property owner are and you know what you can bring to that exchange as well particularly if you're not able to bring rent to the exchange you have to be very aware of kind of um, where everyone is positioned um, so for this reason we do use retail spaces but we also try to be very aware of spaces that might be overlooked that are somehow between public and private not just land like the Abbey Meadow which is um, which is very obvious but things like the mock green of Firma Hall which is used during the summer so it's often used as an exhibition space as well. Um, this is another image from Fanley's. Um, the contemporary music strand I think is little bit of a disruption from the idea of a community festival because we invite in musicians who play at all of the bigger festivals in uh, in the you know around the country but it brings its own um, brings its own value this is a band called We Cut Corners and we heard them on the radio a couple of days after they had played at Benley's talking about what a positive experience that they had in Callan and telling everyone about this unusual location that they played a gig in and how everyone should be, you know, try and be more aware of it. That's obviously very flattering for us, um, but I think there is something about treating, you know, the valuing people who come to your community to contribute to its cultural life and treating those people, you know, as your guests and, uh, you know, one thing that we really try hard to do is to pay artists and I think that's mm -hmm. something that uh, community groups often try to you know ask lots of people to do things for free and if people are willing to volunteer their time that's great but it's important also to remember that artists make money through festivals and events so they're not always in a position to be able to um, to work for free. Um, 
the, the festival is really, a, we try and, and create a true mix of community events and art events that maybe look to other art practices around um, the country. And I think, you know, apart from the value for the artist, there's a huge value in bringing artists to communities um, for the community itself, because the idea of an outsider coming to your area being interested in that place and wanting to make work wanting to tell stories about the place where you're from that does bring a great sense of um of confidence about that place there's a really interesting uh, precedent for me which is in uh, jaipur in india it's called jaipur in so it's in a developing country context where jaipur jaipur in is a residency space and they bring international artists to jaipur to work with local craftspeople and that for that cross person, it's sort of revaluing what their traditional skill is. It maybe might not be valued by their children's generation, uh, but it's also making their space, their place, and, and uh, their culture very uh, feel very valuable. So obviously, we're not in the developing world context, but there's parallels there in bringing contemporary designers and artists and people who have very good reputations in, within their own field to come and work with people who have local, you know, sort of more traditional skills, local people with more traditional skills. So um, Deirdre McMahon and I, I'm going to talk a bit more about Workhouse Assembly, which is the architecture strand this year. Deirdre McMinimum from Lid Architecture uh, established a workshop that was about sewing. And this, of course, attracted a lot of women locally who were quite good at sewing, who could teach all of the young uh, participants who'd come to Callan how to, uh, you know, teach them their, their sewing skills. This is Fen Lee's again, um, a event called The Juicing Room. Um, what I wanted to talk about this image is, as a festival of inclusion and participation, we do try to be aware of who are the people in our society who don't have access maybe to cultural events, and that might be through it might be physical, it might be financial, it could be through exposure to cultural events. Um, and I suppose we look at the kind of key groups, disability because of the Camp Hill and large communities it very much informs what we do. But this year, um, something which we'd never addressed before was the idea of the gay people in our community. So this wasn't a direct, you know, gay night, but it was a, an event that was about identity. And so we looked at how do you construct an identity in a community context, um, but the background of it was we were trying to address you know, different issues for people in, in a rural society. Um, this is just more gratuitous shots, really. Uh, this is a band called I Draw Slow, who are one of my favourite bands. I was really pleased to be able to bring them to Callan in, uh, in 2012, and this is, uh, again, in the co-op. Um, every year we try to reflect on what we've done and look at what are the gaps in our programming and in 2012 we realised that heritage uh, was something that we could maximise a little bit more but also um, as Barbara Ann was saying what are the times of day that people attend events and we realised there was quite a gap in, in the daytime because most of the events were for children so we decided to run lunchtime heritage talks and they are I think far and away one of the most successful uh, activities that we've programmed um, during the festival. I think the word heritage actually automatically attracts a crowd. And I'll speak a little bit about what you can do with that as, as well. Um, but this is another one of our national monuments. It's the Callan Moat. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the heritage talk in the moat because it was on my phone. My phone got stolen. Uh, this is um, <laughs> this is the workhouse assembly participants. We, we go on a walk around the town and we bring people into our town and do that showcasing of all the w things we think are interesting and I think that throws up a lot of ideas um, for people. This is Billy Kyo from Kyo's Bakery. Um, actually the heritage talks uh, they're programmed from within the committee, which is a local festival, but we do try and ensure that the people who are giving the talks are people who have local knowledge, particularly if they're things that are within living memory. So this is Billy Kyo talking about his family's bakery, which has been in his family since 1810. Um, so the guides are giving not only history, but also their own memories and their own experiences of whatever it is that they're speaking about. And uh, I think that this attracts another crowd as well because people are looking through the program I have the program here as well if people want to look through it but they're going through okay names that I don't that I'm not familiar with artists maybe or musicians and then here's Billy Kyo that I know and I really want to go and see him speak so that does you know it, it widens our, um, our 
audience as well. This is Father Dalton talking about uh, the Big Chapel, which is a book that was written about uh, uh, an infraction in uh, Callan in the 1880s. Um, so it's really talking simply about local stories. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, history. And, and the things that are like I just do need to say the things that are beyond living memory. I work with Joe Kennedy from the Heritage Society as part of the committee, and, and we program together. So Joe will, uh, you know, speak about the, those things in more historical terms. But one of the things we found with the Heritage uh, lunchtime talks is that it allows the layers and the complexities of our town to unfold over time. So. You know, when you're talking about an exhibition that might address your town, rather than trying to shove everything in all at the same time and you actually lose your audience, you can allow, allow things to happen. This has been happening over two years. We've only done 10 heritage talks. We still have tons tons of more things that we can do. So it's allowing those layers to, to unfold and kind of complicate the story. Um, for me, coming from having worked in heritage and and now working uh, with contemporary art, which is what I had studied, I'm really interested, interested in how those two things can actually disrupt each other. And I don't think, um, you know, the heritage, a heritage talk necessarily always has to be about history. It doesn't have to be uh, didactic. I, I think what's more interesting is using heritage projects to open up space for conversation. Sometimes that conversation is about our contemporary lives. Um, but Workhouse Assembly was the architecture strand this year, and it was much more of a research-based um, project than we had done with the architecture strand in previous years. We looked at the workhouse, and we did three sort of layers of workshops. So it was a very traditional documentary research layer. Um, lid architecture as I said um, earlier I'll show an image and again they looked at um, a sewing project Garth Kennedy who is an artist from Galway whose work is based on material processes in local contexts. Garth looked at lime render so the participants who were there was an open call there was about 35 people involved who came to Callan for 10 days the um, participants in this workshop, and they rotated through the workshops, um, they looked at the materials that were present in building a workhouse. So the workhouse project in the uh, late, uh, sorry, early 1800s was 166 buildings built over three years, but utilising local materials. So um, Gareth decided it was very important in Kilkenny to look at lime, and the participants made lime render and lime washed um, this space, which is, oh, sorry, a bit close, this space, which is... Um, a, a derelict part of, of the workhouse complex. Um, so they got lime, which is actually from the rubble from a, a, an area of the workhouse where part of the building had been knocked down. They broke the lime, they um, put it into a lime kiln, they slaked it, and then they, they washed the building and had prepared the walls. But in fact, um, for Garth, in our discussions on, in the lead up to the project, he was really interested that stone breaking was one of the activities that people who were living in the workhouse would have engaged in. So again, it's that kind of diagonal way of addressing um, you know, the activities and, and the direct history of the project um, reenacting it but not as a staging not as a spectacle but doing it as really kind of not self-conscious echo of uh, the activities that would have been there when it was being used as a workhouse um, this is the map of three project the back of it but this is at the um one of the public events that we held and in fact these public events I think because people are so intrigued by the workhouses uh, they were incredibly well attended we we're very lucky um, what Lid Architecture did was look at the site of the um, original workhouse. They um, did a, a kind of mapping project with the participants. They did a drawing of it, and then they projected the drawing onto a canvas and proceeded to sew um, the, this plan. And what they did was look at three layers of that. The first was what the site would have looked at, like when the workhouse was built, how it looks today. And um, today it includes two housing clusters, a Camp Hill residence, a farm, the fire station, county council offices, uh, some new um, extensions and new builds. And then they looked at what it might be. So I think after four years of doing projects that were in a diagonal way suggesting here are spaces that could be used for um, cultural events, but we're not going to suggest what they are, I think there was definitely a sense that it was time for us to start considering what might be the um, 
might be the ways to, to more permanently utilise the spaces in our town. So we looked at um, the workhouse and Camp Hill own the workhouse but also are interested in certain parts of the workhouse becoming more public. Um, so the Mapistry project was looking at, from the perspective of looking at just the site, how, uh, how could we design ways that this becomes a more permeable site, more, more um, public. And so that was suggesting knocking down a wall that was built by the, um, the county council in the 1970s so that's, that's quite intimidating, a very high wall. And it also includes suggestion for use of spaces. So for example, um, there was a suggestion that the space that Garth's workshop took place in, that that could be a garden centre connected to the gardening that's already happening on the site. It would be a more public way of engaging the community with the Camp Hill residents while also still preserving privacy for the people who live there. Um, yeah, so I'm just going through, um, just, just to Workhouse Assembly, to look at some of the ways that in our town we're trying to open up conversations, and like I say, the, the town becoming the objects that we're exhibiting um, themselves. But this project brought in a new audience for us again, and that's the sewers that I mentioned. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about um, is the way that, in, not just that you can laterally look at opening up conversations to speak about heritage but you can also use heritage to look at opening up conversations about um, you know the contemporary world that we live in um, this is part of a river walk in Callan which has been a focus of the festival for the four years that it has been happening and prior to that as well we've been walking the river walk um, which goes through the moat field one of these sort of not public but not quite private spaces um, and we've been using it uh, through the architecture strand to go up to a farm in um, in West Court, just, just outside the town where we've also done some building projects. Um, the river walk though in 2012 we thought it would be a really interesting way to talk about rights of way and in 2012, in November 2012, there was a culmination of three years of preparation for legislation that was changing um, sort of people's access to rights of way where you by you would have to register a right of way and you would have to be able to prove that this right of way has existed for a certain number of years and we were interested to have a conversation about rights of way and about public access because obviously it's been part of the conversation that we've been having um, in our town but also the work of commonage that we've done in other places too so for Heritage Week in 2012 we programmed a talk called the Heritage of Rights of Way and we used it to um, trace the river walk to talk about the projects that we had done in the architecture strand through an architecture summer school that year and also you know to talk about history a little bit but asking people what do you think about how this informs our contemporary world our access to land or access to resources and so on so it's a very interesting conversation but looking at heritage as being a much more um, expanded idea than just being history and I would say on that note don't be afraid of your audience or don't also assume that your audience don't know very much actually the uh, conversations with our audience are, are some of the most interesting moments in in our programming both within the festival and with them um, with commonage work and I think that we had been very reticent to look at the workhouse for the first three years of the festival because we felt it had such a dark history we're not sure how this is going to impact on people um, of the commonage team I mean I'm not from Cal and I moved there to be part of the work of, um, of commonage um, my colleague Rosie who also lives in Cal and she is from Callan but has moved back there after quite a number of years of being away so we didn't really want to be the people coming in to tell people in Callan what they should think about their workhouse so it took us a few years to, to be able to address it but as soon as we did you can see here huge numbers of people so obviously there's an appetite for people to discuss this and um, we certainly as a research project we're not uh, coming in with information that we wanted to share we wanted to hear people's stories and that was very important <coughs> I should say as well the workhouse has had many other lives since it was a workhouse it was barracks for the Free State Army it was a knitwear factory it was people's houses it was storage it had a convent in it so it's had lots of other uses and it was the people in the town 
who told us that rather than us having to sort of uncover that through historical research. Let's say that again. Um, I want to talk a little bit about engagement. Um, I suppose because this is a community festival of inclusion and participation, we don't have the, we don't use the phrase outreach. Actually, participation is at the core of what we're doing. So it's not about something interesting happening and then sharing it with a lot of other people. It's about the other people be, being the interesting part of or, or being the people being the interesting part of, of what we're doing. In 2012, an artist called Jenny Moran, who has been involved with um, with actually the other people who work with me in common, she, she uh, went to college with them and has worked with them in um, other projects and has been a big uh, supporter of common. It's Jenny came to us and said, I, I know you're having a seminar, I'd really like to feed the people. Um, in fact, the seminar became a kind of became a day conversation and Jenny's meal uh, was afterwards. We had the meal again in the co-op and we thought this was a really nice event. We were very happy to, to um, have it as part of our programme but what was really interesting for us is afterwards we had 70 people sat down together and we tried to make sure the festival committee were definitely invited but that it was widely known as well. Afterwards people from you know, Callan came up to us and said, now I finally get what Commonage is about. So we've been trying to have these conversations about the built environment and it wasn't until we sat down to have a meal together that the penny started to drop for, for some people that actually this is what we were um, doing. So I think that was a very pivotal moment uh, for us in, in terms of ensuring hospitality is actually very much um, central to our work. Um, I think there's also when I talk about, you know, community events being about friendship and not being about people's consumer um, powers or their uh, working lives or that kind of lingo that we have to engage in in the rest of our lives I think there's something very important about um, creating atmosphere and this is something actually that's very crucial and central to, to Jenny's work as an artist so beautiful lights candles on the table freshly picked flowers they're very simple things to be able to do and they give a sense of atmosphere that you can't really capture and you can't really um, can't really program Oh, I should also say, for, for this meal, um, people paid in. And so, you know, it's, it, with the community festival, you have to be very conscious of, are our events accessible financially? Um, do, do we have paid events? Do we have free events? And a lot of events are ticketed that you would expect, like theatre and music, for example. Um, but I think it is valuable for people to be able to pay to, to attend certain events. People feel a great value in, in being, you know, able to do that it's, it's not all about charity work or the you know outreach in that sense of sort of bringing culture to people people also want to engage in it in that level uh, as well um something that's very important uh, i find as well with engagement is communication so before you even um have people in the door you need to be communicating to people what it is that they're that they'll expect um, i guess we'll go to the program for a second and it has taken you know it takes huge weeks and weeks of work for this program uh, to come out and, and to have all the information presented in the way that we think it will be accessible to people but we have um you know we have strands that that people can see so they can go down through and see i'm interested in coming to the um, family days so you can just look down very quickly and, and find them so the way you present your information is, is very crucial but also the kind of signage in, you know, verbal signage, way marking when you um, when your people are, are there. So you know, introducing your event um, properly, explaining what your event is about, and then you know, allowing space to have conversation. I mean, these sound like very simple things, but you can easily forget them, particularly if you're you know trying to do lot juggle lots of things at once. You, in a community context, you're probably organising five events that are all happening on the same day. You can forget those yourself, but just ensuring that you have space for conversation. Um, this is a one of the heritage talks in 2012 that was about the old co-op which we had been using for a number of years. And um, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to show it was because of the amount of artefacts and objects that the um, man who had worked for, for Callan Co-op had collected. And 
I suppose we could have put them out in an exhibition, we could have made an object-based exhibition about the co-op, and I think people would have been interested and would have been engaged by that, but there was also another value in being able to see him lay things out on the table and pick them up and say, this is what I used then, this is the person who used that, and have the conversation, or sorry, have the space for conversation after the talk. Um, workshops, I mean, uh, Jenny and Barbara Ann were both talking about workshops, and I think we found this as a way to increase audience numbers but also to make you know bring make sure people are invested in the work that um that we're doing so this is workhouse assembly again deirdre with those uh women that you saw in the image earlier as well this is them actually at the workshop uh obviously looking at the tapestry from from the direction that they're in and, and having a chat about it so it is a way you know another way like hospitality of people sitting down for a couple of hours and talking or, or you know physically being involved as well yeah. Children, children's workshops. I think the interesting thing about children, just in terms of visitor numbers as well, is if you get children involved, you automatically have their parents involved as well, and then the parents might look at the program and realise there's something on at night that they'd like to go and see. You know, in a, in a small town, this is another way of spreading the word. In fact. Uh, talk a little bit about the strategic changes that we're trying to make next year but one of the things that we've realised in terms of timing in the year is the Iron Reef Festival happens in the last week in July first kind of week in or first few days in August and we realised that because we're so distant in the calendar from school time a lot of the children are not aware of what's happening so this year we're bringing the program forward so it's going to be the last week in June so we can go through the schools to get children engaged in the workshops and you know get a much larger group of people um talking about teenagers actually we have a huge amount of teenagers in Callan that are very involved in the festival and we do this in a number of ways these are actually all workshops leading up to um our spectacle which I'm going to show you images of in a, a minute it was really um really spectacular if you want to be better at um, but I suppose yeah having workshops that are are hitting different target groups on different levels I just go to um go to the to the program so this one was called material workshops and it's specified on it this is for age 12 plus so I mean for teenagers they like to know they're in an environment where they're not being treated like children so to have a 12 plus workshop meant they knew they were going to be meeting their peers they were doing something cool which is costume making and obviously uh, you can imagine there was a gender imbalance and that there was quite a lot of girls at this workshop um, but it felt like something that was relevant to, to their lives to be working with I mean they weren't making making fashion items, they certainly weren't making items that they were going to wear themselves, but to start to learn those skills and to do it in an environment where they were um, meeting their friends. But also um, workshops for younger children, this was a filmmaking workshop, so a number of children were engaged in actually documenting the spectacle and put a film together. Um, in previous years we've had children, or sorry, teenagers working with Cartoon Saloon in Kilkenny on filmmaking and animation for the festival as well. So, you know, there is a sense of trying to find what, what is the cool thing that teenagers want to engage with, and you can find that out from asking them, they'll tell you. Um, absolutely no, no fear of that. Um, just to go back to, to teenagers again, because there is an important note, um, I was trying to think, and, and Liam had asked me to talk about you know, what works and what doesn't work, and thinking through how to engage people, and I suppose how people are invested. Um, in 2011, after the festival had happened for the first year in 2010, in the old co-op there was quite a lot of vandalism because it's a small town we had a fair or you know it was known amongst the committee there was a fair idea of who actually had been responsible for the vandalism they were young people in 2011 workshop started with um gusto and i suppose I don't think it was the same people who had been involved in the vandalism who were then in the workshops, but probably the street cred of the festival rose a bit because teenagers were involved and there hasn't been any vandalism of um, Henry Festival paraphernalia or any of the spaces or really any trouble since that time. That was just that one moment. But I think that involving teenagers means that you know they, they maybe can engage with their peer group a little bit more than they can with adults or with children so if they feel that their peer group are invested in this it you know might change their attitude to the festival that's another very cool workshop stilt uh, stilt walkers um so this is the spectacle 
this is totally gratuitous. <laughs> we were very lucky to have had um, a very large grant from the Arts Council to fund the workshops and uh, also support from Kilkenny Leader Partnership to lead up to the workshops uh, for the festival this year. So this is our highlight event. Um, and finally, just say a few words. I actually don't have a watch. I'm not sure how I'm doing on, on timing, but I'll just say a few words about um, promotion now. As we kind of the division of labour within the the committee, and um, promotion is not something I myself am I'm particularly a, a key player in, although of course I'm involved. Um, but and, and apart from the nugget of put the word heritage on your event and you'll get a crowd, uh, I can say that you know communication has to happen in lots of different levels so this publication this you know this promotional information which costs quite a lot of money in terms of design and in terms of print it's totally invaluable we wouldn't get a crowd if we, if we weren't putting these out around the town um flyers or sometimes programs go into every house in Callan. we have people who actually walk around the town and put them into every door um there was a report came out yesterday from the arts council about audiences and a really interesting thing that they said is those who are involved in, in cultural activity respond better than anyone else in the community to um mail mail it out you know the pieces of paper that come in the door so apparently people who are interested in culture are much more perceptive to what's coming in the door so it was interesting to note um i mean obviously we have a website we have social media we're quite careful about our social media we try to put up pictures um that are engaging pictures you know like this uh but also pictures of that are things that are really happening in, in Callan. So you can use stock images, which are good if in an absence of images, but people really engage with images of their own town. And you can see that from the amount of people engaging on the, the Facebook page. Um, local radio, of course, local newspapers, all those avenues people really, are, you know, when you ask people, people really are engaging with. I saw an ad in the local shop where I saw, uh, I heard you talking about it on the radio, you know, it can be hard to measure if those are actually having an impact on people, but it does seem from conversations that they work. Um, why, I want, why I'm showing this image is, um, I mean, we do have traditional types, m more traditional types of um, exhibitions in, in Callan as well. So I, as part of the programme this year, I curated a painting show that was two painters from Kilkenny looking at our, our, our local landscape. Um, but very last minute, in fact, the day before the exhibition was to open, I realised I didn't have proper signage. And this is another thing when you're engaging it putting up false walls and painting and installing and making sure that the work gets to Callan on time, you can't forget about the signage. And so I had um, the vinyl printed <laughs> the day before. And in terms of my budget, which is at the very end of my budget, this is actually a huge amount. Um, it was only 80 euro, but it was a very tight budget. So it was a huge amount for me to be able to... Um, you know, to pay uh, the day before the exhibition was to open, but I have to say it's probably the best decision that I made because when you were on the street, this was held in um, an old church that's uh, been uh, decommissioned, I suppose, no, no longer being used. Um, in, when you were on the street and the building is set back, that's the one thing that you could see in the door was uh, the signage for the, for the exhibition. This is the exhibition um, itself. Um, yeah. So I, I do hear just listening today about people talking about um, how to stage an exhibition. I mean, this was expensive. We had wood donated from um, Medite that was also donated for other activities that was happening in Callan. Um, but I still spent several hundred euro on getting the wood made into a false wall by a carpenter on... Um, you know, making sure there was a proper finish on the wall, painting them. We do in Callan um, for the festival work with professional installers, which I absolutely think is worth the money. And I think that's as much for the artist as and as for the community. It works for everyone. If your um, exhibition looks professional, people give it that kind of respect, and so that that does work for everyone. Um, so it was an expensive event, um, but. The reason why we did this event is actually it wasn't part of the Iron Reef Festival, but I had commissioned the artist to make work for the Iron Reef Festival. This venue wasn't available because you saw there was stilt walking workshops there and, and all the workshops were happening. So I had an exhibition in the Mocker in a firma hall, but um, we moved it to this venue for the Kilkenny Arts Festival. So when you're aware of the timing of your, your um, event, try to 
key in, you know, clue into what else is happening in your county. So we were aware, we made a submission to the um, Kilkenny Arts Festival, aware that if this went out in their information and they have like 40,000, uh, a reach of about 40,000 um, people, that this was also increasing the audience coming to Cal and, and um, being aware of the Iron Reef Festival. So that was kind of like increasing our promotion. Um, so I suppose that, that's where I'm... Um, where I'll end. Um, just a bit of reflection, I suppose, on, on the previous uh, four years and, and two years that I've really been um, engaged. We reflect every year, and as I say, strategic changes in 2014 are going to include changing the timing of um, of the event, and that was kind of a painful thing. You know, we had to make sure everyone in the committee um, was was on board for that, um, but being able to be nimble and take account of those changes is very important in terms of the success rate of your event I think um, also this idea of the division of labour in fact after four years we're only starting to get good at subcommittees <laughs> so that we're not all <laughs> trodding on everyone else's toes and that people are able to concentrate and do proper work and don't overstretch yourself as well it can be very easy to be a martyr to the idea that you think is interesting for your area but if you're not enjoying it uh, you can be very resentful and very bitter and I think that that you know extends into how people enjoy your event as well so so um make sure it's enjoyable Anyway, you got this. <laughs> oh, <I have> <laughs>